Imagine if every moment of your life was recorded. Everything you did, everything you said, all the places that you went, all the ways in which you spent your time. And towards the end of your life, a museum was built to honor you. Only the museum would show your life exactly how you lived it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. One of our most precious resources is our time. And I am so grateful that you have chosen to spend some time here with me tonight. And I promise to do my very best to make it worth your while. We do have a relatively short amount of time together, so I'm going to get right to it. Do me a favor, please, and take everything that is in your hands, including your phones, and go ahead and put them in the seat next to you or on the floor. So everything in your hands on the floor for me, please. Go ahead and take your feet and put those flat on the floor. So uncross your legs. Excellent. And go ahead and take your hands and place them flat on your knees. Now, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. If you feel that it would make you uncomfortable in any way, you are welcome to keep your eyes open, but you will find that it is much more powerful if you do indeed close your eyes. Now, if you think that in closing your eyes, you may tip to one side or the other, simply turn to the person next to you, introduce yourself and say, I may get to know you even better in a couple of seconds. Now, you don't need to worry about when it's time to open your eyes again, because I will let you know that. And I am all about laughter, I am all about loudness, I am all about goofing off. However, for this particular portion of our time together, I ask that you maintain quiet throughout the entire experience. So please, feet flat on the floor, hands flat on your knees, and go ahead and close your eyes. Take a nice deep breath in for me, please. And exhale. And a nice deep breath in for me, please. And exhale. Go ahead and keep your eyes closed. Imagine if every moment of your life was recorded. Everything you did, everything you said, all the places that you went, all the ways in which you spent your time. And towards the end of your life, a museum was built to honor you. Only the museum would show your life exactly how you lived it. So if 80% of your time was spent at a job that you didn't enjoy or on activities that made you unhappy, then 80% of your museum would be dedicated towards that. There would be pictures and videos and kiosks. If you love spending time with your family or pursuing some particular passion or hobby, but for whatever reason, you only spent 2% of your time on those loves. Then no matter how much you wished it to be different, only 2% of your museum would be dedicated towards that. Maybe just a few pictures near the exit door. Imagine what it would be like to walk your museum at the end of your life. How would you feel? What would you see? Now imagine if heaven or the afterlife or however you perceive this whole experience to work actually consists of you being the tour guide for your own museum for all of eternity. Excellent. Take a nice deep breath in for me, please. And exhale. Go ahead and open your eyes. Shake your arms out a little. How do you feel? Yeah. relaxed, peaceful. This concept of Museum Day I first introduced in a book that I wrote and I wanted to share it with you tonight for two reasons. The first is that as an author, it is very common when people come up to me that they share something that meant a lot to them from one of the books and this concept of Museum Day often heads that list. And so if you take nothing else away from our time together, I hope that this concept has inspired you in some way. The second reason is because we live in a very fast paced world. And as I look around, I see people who are dealing with stress and anxiety. And I want you to know that in the future, if you're dealing with that, I encourage you to take a little time in your own private museum. I walked you through it today, but in the future, just put yourself in a quiet environment. Put your feet flat on the floor, your hands flat on your knees, close your eyes, and spend a little time walking through your museum. It is the most incredible way to center yourself and to find the answers you seek, even in the most difficult of times. Now I have found the way to create an amazing museum. 
a museum that you would be proud to walk not just today, not just tomorrow, but literally for all of eternity, is by focusing on something called the Big Five for Life. Now, the Big Five for Life has its origins in Africa. People go on safari in Africa, they all talk about the African Big Five, and it's these five specific animals people want to see. And they gauge the success of their safari experience based on how many of the five they see. So if they see three of the five, okay, four of the five, better. But if they see all five of the African Big Five, nirvana, right? Exactly what they came to Africa for. Well, early on in my author career, I had a profound moment as it relates to this. And the profound moment was the following. Imagine if we were to look at our lives this way. What if we were to identify the five things that we most want to do, see, or experience in our lifetime before we die? The five things so powerful that if we did, saw, or experience them, that on our deathbed, in the last few moments of our life, we could say, well, no matter what else I did or I didn't get to, I got to my big five for life, and therefore my life is a success by my own definition of success. And that's a critical point because this isn't about your parents, it's not about your neighbors, it's not about your boss, even your spouse or significant other. This is about you asking yourself, what do you want in your museum? What are your big five for life? Now what makes this concept so special is just how simple and yet how powerful it is. And also the degree to which it is missing in most of our lives. Look at this stadium. Right? If I was to take the combined resume or CV of all of you here, 15,000 people, it would be staggering. All your education, work experience, things you've done. And yet I know from working with audiences around the world that if I had a chance to ask you, how many of you have had even one person ask you for even one thing that you most want to do, see or experience in your lifetime before you die? Very few hands would go up. And what is the danger if we don't know what we want in our museum or we don't know what our big five for life are? In all likelihood, we're never going to get to do, see, or experience them. How many of you like this idea? You go through your life, you do all the things that you do, you see all the things that you see, you have all the experiences that you have, and towards the very end of your life, you're sort of reflecting. You say, ah, my life. What an unbelievable failure. Would any of us sign up for that? Of course not, all right? Of course not. And yet, what is the opposite of our own personal definition of success? So let me see if I can help launch us on a better trajectory. How many of you know where you are right now? Wow, that's scary. Not a trick question. How many of you know where you are right now? Of course you do, you're right here, right? And when, you, so when you know you, you, and when you know your big five for life, you're gonna know where you wanna go. So you know where you are, you know where you wanna go. What is the question to ask? Well, if you're like most people, the answer that I get back most commonly is how do I get there? How do I get there? And in that moment in asking that question, you've fallen into a trap more debilitating than dengue fever, yellow fever, malaria, and all the rest of the African diseases combined. You see, every time you ask that question, how? It's like a barrier, a learning curve, or an obstacle. And think of these as like a mountain, right? If you say, John, these are my big five for life, nothing's gonna keep me from my big five for life, right? So you use some time, you use some energy, you get to the top of the first mountain, you look out and you see another mountain. If you say, John, no, 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 these are my big five for life, right? Nothing's gonna keep me from my big five for life. So you use some time, you use some energy, you get to the second, top of the second mountain, you look out and you see another mountain. And what happens to most people by the time they get to the third mountain? They give up, right? They've fallen into the pit. They've fallen into the trap. But the good news is there is a way to avoid this trap completely. You see, the question is not how. The question is who. I guarantee you that no matter what is on your big five for life list, that someone at some point in the history of this planet has done a scene or experienced it or something close to it. All you gotta do is find this person or group of people, learn everything you can about what they did and imitate it, at least at the start. And when you do that, you will find that not only do you not go in the trap, but you are literally catapulted over the tops of these mountains. 
Now, there has never been a better time in human history for finding your who's. These little devices that we carry with us that I see all over the place in the audience here because you're filming, right? Our phones, they can connect you in an instant to every documented story of practically every who who has ever lived. But only if we ask you to. Let me give an example of the power of the who through a really cool story. I was doing an event one time and a lady came up to me afterwards and she said, I have a great story for you. So I love great stories. What's your great story? She said, well, I use this power of the who. She said, I was trained as a personal chef, professional chef. And she said, but after graduating, she said, I decided what I really wanted to do was to go cruise the Caribbean. She said, so I used this who technique. I told everybody about my dream. She said, I told the, my friends, my family, even complete strangers. She said, I told the people at the chef school where I was trained. She said, three days later, I get a phone call. It's the people at the chef school. They said, you're not gonna believe this. A guy just walked in here with his wife. They own a private yacht. They are going to go cruise the Caribbean and they're looking to hire a personal chef. And we thought of you, right? And I said, well, what happened next? She said, well, I went for the interview, which consisted of making a bunch of meals and they loved it, so I got hired. I said, what'd you do on board? She said, well, I was the chef, so of course I was responsible for making the meals. And I said, every meal? She said, oh, no, no, the Caribbean, it's full of islands. She said, every time we stopped at an island, they had a favorite restaurant. I said, well, what about serving the food? She said, oh, no, no, they had a special person who did that. I said, well, what about cleaning up afterwards? She said, oh, no, no, they had a special person who did that. I said, well, what about getting the groceries? She said, well, I'm a chef, so I like to get my own groceries, but if I didn't feel like it, they had a special person who did that. I said, where'd you stay? She said, well, I had my own private stateroom aboard the yacht. I said, and when you weren't cooking, when you weren't being a chef? She said, oh, my time was my own. I could do whatever I wanted. And I'll never forget it, because then she looked me straight in the eye and she said, oh, and by the way, I got paid a lot of money for this too. I said, how long did you do this? She said, 18 months. 18 months. I said, why did you quit? She said, ah, I got bored of cruising the Caribbean. How many of you would like to have the problem of getting bored of being paid to cruise the Caribbean? All right? That is a big five for life type of problem right there. Ladies and gentlemen, I have one more story that I would like to share with you. It's a story of a personal hero of mine, an incredible who. Her name is Wangari Maathai. Uh, her story is so amazing that it literally would take two books to tell the whole story effectively. I wanna try and honor her tonight though by at least sharing with you a tiny bit of that story. Wangari Maathai was born in a small village in Kenya, in Africa. And as a small child, she noticed that women in her village would spend hours collecting wood for the most basic of necessities. And even as a kid, she realized that this was kind of crazy. But the government in charge of the country had massively deforested, leaving less next to nothing for the everyday people. She was a kid, she didn't know what she could do about this, but she studied hard, she worked super hard, and eventually got, she got a scholarship. And she went overseas to study, and she got her bachelor's degree. And then she got her master's degree. And over time, she ended up getting her doctorate degree, becoming the first woman in Central Africa ever to do that. She knew that she wanted to make a difference. And she just wasn't sure the way she could do that. And the situation had gotten far worse than it had been when she first left. People were literally digging up roots to burn for wood. So one day she said, I'm going to plant trees. And so she did. And then she planted some more trees. And she planted some more trees. And she planted some more trees. And pretty soon other women from other villages were coming to her and saying, hey, Wangari, you look so happy when you're doing that. Can you teach us to plant trees too? She said, sure. And as she was teaching these women to plant trees, she noticed something. She noticed that they were gaining a sense of confidence. They were gaining a sense of purpose, a sense of connectedness. They were realizing that they were more than just who they thought they were. Well, this did not sit so well with the uh, people in charge of the country. They actually called Wangari Maathai a threat to national security because she was teaching women to plant trees. At the age of 49, 
when Gary learned that the dictatorship in charge of the country announced a plan to remove the largest green space in the capital city of Nairobi. They were going to tear it out and put up skyscrapers and a six-story statue of the dictator. So she went to the capital city to protest. And in exchange for her efforts, she was beaten by forces of the government and dragged off to jail. And when she got to jail, they insisted that she sign her arrest warrant. And in one of those moments that I can only think of as one of the most defining moments in a human life, she said, I'll sign it, but I'll sign it in the blood from the wounds that you gave me today. And that's how she signed it. Fast forward 13 long years. There are democratic elections in Kenya for the first time in a very long time. When Gary Matai is named Deputy Minister of the Environment for the whole country. Over the course of her life, she and the people she inspired have planted more than 30 million trees. They have reforested a country. At the age of 64, when Gary was asked to plant a tree, just one tree, but it was an important tree because it marked a very special event. Because on that day, she became the first African woman ever to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Isn't that amazing? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you have on your big five for life list. I don't know if you plan on helping overthrow a brutal dictatorship or reforest a country or something completely different. But as a who, what Wangari Matai has taught us is that you take it one step at a time, one day at a time, one tree at a time, and you never give up. And when you do that, amazing things will follow. I see that my time is winding down, so let me share one final thought with you. Very often when I talk to people and hear from people about something they would like to do, see, or experience, they say something to the effect of, as soon as I get more free time, then I'm going to, right? We have this cultural perception of free time, like it's gonna show up in a box one day. We're gonna open the door to go out of work, to go to work, we're gonna look down and be like, hey, honey, great news, Amazon delivered the free time. Now we can finally go do all those things we wanna do. And while it would be awesome if it worked that way, we know that's not the case. We get the free time by making the conscious decision to create the free time in our lives. Statistically speaking, the average life is 28,900 days. Hopefully more, sometimes less. If you really wanna motivate yourself, take your age, multiply by 365, and subtract from 28,900. Mathematically, that's about how many days you have left on the planet. And in the blink of an eye, days become weeks and weeks become months. And just like that, another year has gone by. And if we're not careful, we get to the end of our lives and we realize that the life we lived paled in comparison to the life that we really wanted to live. Ladies and gentlemen, you are here in this life for a reason just like when Gary Matai was. Find that reason, find your reason, fulfill your reason. Build an incredible museum of your life. And in the process, you will inspire countless others to do the same in their own lives. That's what great leadership is. That's how we change the world. And that's what you are capable of. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for being here tonight. It has been an honor and a privilege to get a chance to spend some time with you. I wish you all the best as you're out there filling your Big Five for Life adventures and filling your museum with incredible museum moments. Thank you. <laughs>